Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to our special event today. And I want to say a special welcome as well, in addition to all the wonderful people we have right here in this room. Thank you also to everyone who we have online via media site also watching our presentation today. We're glad you could all join us. My name is Elisa Cahoy, and I am very proud to serve as an assistant director of the Pennsylvania <coughs> Center for the Book. Now, before we get started, just a few housekeeping items. This event is going to go until 5 o'clock, and we are also going to have a book signing after the event. You can see right over there we have our books, and we welcome you to stay, meet Sarah, get a book, get an autograph, so please don't leave right at the end. We hope you can stay with us a little bit longer. And before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the contributions of some people in this room right now. We would like to, th and I actually, can I say, we have a lot of people to thank, so hold your applause until I am done. We would first like to thank Dean Barbara Dewey for sponsoring the Pennsylvania Center for the Book and for her support of this award in particular. We would like to thank Associate Dean Ann Langley for her guidance. Thank you to Jill Shockey and Nathan Valchar for their public relations and design assistance. A thank you to the faculty and staff of the Pennsylvania Center for the Book, including, right here in the front row, our outreach coordinator, Caroline Wermuth. Thank you to our recently retired Emeritus Director, Stephen Herb. Thank you to our Lynn Ward Prize Advisory Board members who guide and steward this award from year to year. Jose Guerrero, John Meyer, Rebecca Miller, Joel Pretty, Jay Harlan Ritchie, Scott Smith, and the director of the Pennsylvania Center for the Book, Carla Schmidt. We also recognize the financial contributions <coughs> of the Special Collections Library, Library Learning Services, the College of Liberal Arts, and the English Department in the continuation and support of this award. We would like to recognize Robin Ward Savage and Nanda Whedon Ward for their donation of the materials of their father, Lind Ward, to Penn State University. The Lind Ward Prize recognizes and honors Mr. Ward's significant influence on the development of the graphic novel and celebrates the gift of an extensive collection of Ward's wood engravings, original book illustrations, and other graphic art materials donated by Robin and Nanda. Between 1929 and 1937, Ward published his six groundbreaking <coughs> Wardless novels, God's Man, Madman's Drum, Wild Pilgrimage, Prelude to a Million Years, Songs Without Words, and Vertigo, all of which have been reissued by the Library of America in a two-volume box set, which has been donated by the Library of America and will be presented as part of the Lind Ward Prize today. The Lind Ward Prize was established in part because of Penn State's strong interest in the art of the graphic novel, and this is the seventh year of the award, which is presented annually to the best graphic novel, fiction or nonfiction, published in the previous calendar year by a living U.S. or Canadian citizen or resident. And it is now my pleasure to introduce the chair of the 2017 Lind Ward Prize jury, Stephanie Orme, who will present the Honor Book Awards and the Lind Ward Prize Award for 2017. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I first want to take a moment to introduce my colleagues who served uh, on the jury with me, uh, who are an extreme pleasure to work with, and they could all be here today, which is uh, stellar. So as I introduce you, if you want to stand up so everybody can see you, that'd be fantastic. Um, so for those who don't know, the Lind Ward Prize Jury typically consists of a combination of faculty members associated with Penn State who use graphic novels in their research or in the classroom, as well as alum from Penn State, and also students, undergraduate students and graduate students alike. Um, I'm a graduate student in the College of Communications. I've done research on, on graphic novels and comic book culture. Uh, so first, serving with me on the committee, we have Amy Madison. Uh, Amy works as an adult services librarian at Slow Center Region Library here in State College. Amy's also a co-organizer co of BookFest PA. Second, there's Jessica Sincenic, a junior at Penn State majoring in English and telecommunications, who has a deep appreciation for the interplay of words and images in graphic novels. 
Third is Emily Steinberg, joining us all the way from Philadelphia, who brought her valuable experiences as a painter of graphic arts to the jury. Emily teaches courses on painting and graphic novels at Penn State Abington. Finally, we have John Weaver from Williamsport, Pennsylvania. John teaches English at Williamsport High School, and he's been incorporating graphic novels into his teaching for well over 15 years. He's also published and presented on the subject of graphic novels in the classroom. So thank you again to our jurors. Thanks, guys. I know that I speak on behalf of the whole jury when I say that this process was so much fun and such a pleasure to do. Uh, all told, we probably read well over 100 graphic novels in the course of a few months, and we spent literally hours deliberating the merits of each of these books. While it may seem daunting on top of teaching and research and being an undergraduate student and doing homework and attending classes, I can honestly say that for us, I don't think it felt like work at all. It was, it was such a joy to do. So uh, we're all honored to be, to be chosen for that process. But eventually, after months of reading, hours of deliberation among ourselves, three books surfaced in our minds as being worthy uh, of the spirit of the Lind Ward Prize. Uh, we chose these books based on their originality, innovative use of form and content, and for having stories that resonated with us on a very human level. So the first book we would like to honor tonight is Hot Dog Taste Test by Lisa Hannawalt. Hilariously, quirkily drawn, and often musing about taboo topics, Lisa Hannawalt's Hot Dog Taste Test is a deliciously amusing read. The author skips about from subject to subject in a frenetic hyper sprint that very much simulates our actual nanosecond culture. She draws about food and bathroom problems among other far-flung everyday issues and pushes the boundaries of our comfort zone. Using a variety of media and dizzying varied page formats, she keeps the reader riveted from page to page as she reveals her gloriously freewheeling mind and generosity of spirit. Hot Dog Taste Test is a laugh out loud celebration of individuality and the goofy everyday thoughts that we tend to usually keep private. Next, we have Cousin Joseph by Jules Pfeiffer. Jules Pfeiffer, who has been creating incredible work for over 70 years, continues his streak with Cousin Joseph, a beautifully illustrated noir novel. Pfeiffer portrays an important part of American history, anti-union sentiments and the fear of socialists in Hollywood creating films that would shift our culture to the left, one that feels especially relevant in today's political climate. It's a captivating story meshed with gorgeous ink wash drawings done in Pfeiffer's characteristic wobbly, lively line. The varied page compositions are fresh and vivid. Cousin Joseph demonstrates Pfeiffer's complete mastery of his craft. Of course, finally, we have Rolling Blackouts, Dispatches from Turkey, Syria, and Iraq by Sarah Glidden. Part memoir, part travel log, Rolling Blackouts is the true story of Sarah Glidden, a cartoonist accompanying two journalists and a former Marine to Turkey, Syria, and Iraq to research the effects of the Iraq War on the Middle East. Throughout her journey, Glidden raises questions about the nature of journalism, its role in reporting on conflict zones, and how media producers decide which stories are worth telling. Yet Rolling Blackouts is also more than just Glidden's story. Ultimately, it is the story of the political officials, civilians, and refugees who live there. Her book brings readers to the front lines of war in the Middle East and leads them through the thicket of obstacles journalists encounter to get their story, all while using storytelling that is intimate, engaging, and frequently humorous. Glidden's attention to details such as characters' body language helps convey the human element of the story she tells, all while portraying opposite sides of opposing conflicts. The images welcome the reader into the complex and many-layered world of the Middle East, and Glidden is a terrific guide. I would now like to present the 2017 Lynn Ward Prize to this year's winner, Sarah Glidden. First of all, thank you so much. This is a huge honor to be here and to receive this award. I want to thank the jury, the advisory committee, Penn State, Carolyn Wormuth, the family of Lynn Ward for putting this together and for um, having me here. So it's a huge, huge honor. Um, I'm going to be thanking a lot of people today because this is the first time I've received a prize like this. So I feel like an acceptance speech has a lot of thank yous in it. Um, and I have a lot of people to thank because while comic, making comics involves really being alone for long periods of time, sitting in a room, working, it's very solitary. Um, I really wouldn't be here, and this book couldn't have been made 
without a lot of people um, helping me along the way. And you know, first off, I should thank John and Coralie for making a beautiful book. It's hard to print watercolor, so that it looks <coughs> as nice as it does on paper, and they did a really great job. After that, first off, I should thank my mother. My mom, who might be watching this right now, she deserves a lot of things, first of all, for giving me life. Um, and second of all, she was a professor of public health at Boston University for a long time. And she didn't really love working at Boston University for various administrative reasons, but she stayed there so that I could go to school for free. Um, and she deserves a lot of thanks for that, um, my brother as well, actually. So I went to the um, Boston University School for the Arts. That's me and my studio to sell portraits. My mom was always a really political person. She was really, she's been heavily involved with working against domestic violence, human trafficking. She was very involved, you know, in the anti-war protests of Vietnam. And so I rebelled against her by not being political at all when I was a teenager. Um, maybe partly because I was living pretty comfortably in a Massachusetts suburb in the 90s and everything seemed to be going fine. Um, so I went to art school. I didn't really know what I was going to do with an art school education, but I was just mostly having fun and learning how to paint. Um, my school is a very classical based school, so we did a lot of um, drawing from the model, a lot of still lives and things like that. Not a lot of interaction with contemporary art or the politics that were really a big part of the art world at the time, back in the 2000s. So a lot of things changed for me um, when 9-11 happened. Um, I know that's a really big cliche, but it's true. Um, it was kind of a wake-up call to me. I was 21 at the time, and I realized that I just hadn't been paying attention to anything. Um, it kind of you know, came out of the blue for me because I wasn't really interested in politics and it made me realize that there was a lot of stuff going on in the world. Um, our country was involved in a lot of different places. And the kind of narrative that I started hearing immediately after that happened, that these people hate our freedom and that's, that's all there is to it, it seemed that things were more complicated than that. So I began to feel like it was kind of useless making these kind of abstracted landscape paintings. Like, what was I doing just painting and making stuff that if I made it, you know, to the top of the top, someone would be buying this and putting it in cold storage and never looking at it again. And let's face it, no one was going to be paying thousands of dollars for my uh, landscape painting. So I wanted to get more involved. Um, I became kind of a news junkie, and so I was looking at a lot of photojournalism, um, and that seemed to me a better way to kind of make art about the world. But I still didn't really know how to do that. You know, I was kind of looking at things like, oh, look at what we've done with the world, shipping containers, or I got an opportunity as a student to be a photographer for um, a museum exhibitions planner who went to Mongolia and China. So I went with him and was able to take pictures. But I was really looking at these subjects of mine as kind of from a distance, using a telephoto lens, like not really doing the work that a photojournalist actually has to do, which is get to know your subject, talk to them, um, meet them, and figure out what the context is of this place they live in. To me, it was more like, oh, this is interesting um, scenery, or look at these people who are so fascinating in their you know, traditional costumes. Even when I tried stuff closer to home, that was more of like, you know, I'd do kind of take pictures at anti-war protests, I still didn't really understand the context of what was going on. I mean, I was 22, so you can't blame me for not knowing exactly everything about globalization and the Iraq war that was about to happen right away, but I wanted to try. So around that time, I should now talk about my influences, thank them, um, because this was around the time that I started reading comics that were not just for kids. Um, I didn't really know that comics could be about serious things before I was in my early 20s. I had always read Calvin and Hobbes, Mad Magazine, oh, stuff oh. like that. Um, but it wasn't until I read Mouse by Art Spiegelman, um, which is about is a biography of his father who survived the Holocaust, and also Persepolis by Marjan Satrapi, um, who was an Iranian girl um, during the revolution and then eventually moved to Europe and made this comic about her life. I also read Joe Sacco's work, um, who's kind of 
like the father of comics journalism, or at, at least to me, the big hero. So all three of these people have something in common, which is that they're writing from um, about real world things from a kind of autobiographical perspective. So Art Spiegelman is, includes himself interviewing his father, Marjan Satrafi, obviously she, it's her story. And Joe Sacco as a journalist includes himself in these works. And so when I first discovered these comics, these were not things that I thought that I could make myself. Comics was still not something that I thought that I could do. It was something that I just liked reading and that I was getting more and more interested in. Um, that changed when I started reading James Kachalka. He did this strip called American Elf for about 15 years. Every single day he did a four panel or a two panel comic about something that happened to him that day. And you know, when you compare them to the three artists I just showed you before, it's not that monumental. This is just a guy living in Vermont and his family and his life. But to me it was really inspiring because I thought, oh, this I can do. I can write about stuff that happens in my life because, you know, it doesn't matter and I'm just like him, just some guy. Um, so that was how I got into comics. And if anyone is considering trying comics, I really recommend journal comics or diary comics. Um, this is my very first one. It's very embarrassing, but I'm showing you because I care. Um, and basically doing these kinds of comics gives you an opportunity to not care too much if it's not perfect, which is what you need to do when you're starting to do any kind of art. Um, I ex experimented with different kind of materials um, different styles, different ways of using panels, um, using wordless comics, and you know, expression, and learning the comics language because comics really is a language. It has vocabulary and it has grammar um, and it has style. And these are things that you have to experiment with before you get really comfortable. Um, I can also kind of, when I look back at these, I can see who was influencing me at the time. Like this is a perfect copy of David B. David a uh, French cartoonist who I was like kind of imitating at the time. Even if there's nothing going on in your day, you can make a plop gag about how you don't know what to write about. So <laughs> journal <laughs> comics are easy. Um, now is the time when I thank the friends that I made while I was doing this. Um, this is a page by Julia Wirtz. Um, when I first started making comics, I didn't have other people who were making them. So I didn't have anyone to feel all this stuff off of. But then I started putting my comics on Flickr, which I don't know, it still exists, but maybe not as much anymore. Um, and this is how I met other people who were making comics, like Julia, who did a comic called The Fart Party. Um, she has evolved from The Fart Party. <laughs> she actually has a new book coming out this week, and she's in New York for it right now. It's called Tenements, Towers, and Trash. Amazing. Uh, Laura Park is another artist who I met on Flickr. She actually has an exhibit right now um, in Columbus at the Columbus Museum of Art. So if you happen to go to Columbus, you should really check it out. She's amazing. Um, and then living in New York, I met Gabrielle Bell and other artists like her. And a lot of us were all doing autobiographical work, um, you know, sometimes straying from autobio into fantasy. And meeting them like, gave me a community. It was something that I hadn't had before. And it's super important. They taught me how to make your comic into a mini comic. So like printing it out at Kinko's and then folding it and stapling it. Um, and that's how you got your stuff out to other people. That was incredible. Around the same time, I met these three people, um, Jessica Hartnow, Sarah Dudeville, and Alex Stonehill. This is a picture of them in Morocco when they were in their early 20s. They look like babies to me now. Um, and these are very important friends because they will show up in rolling blackouts. But around the time that I met them, they were going to school for media studies um, and various other things. And they had already traveled a lot in the world. And they really inspired me in the way that they approached the world and the people in it, and the stories in it. Um, and we talked a lot about stuff and we bonded over politics. And they really like blew me away when they decided to just form a nonprofit multimedia journalism collective and just go all over the world and do reporting. Um, they called themselves the Common Language Project. They later became the Seattle Globalists. And I didn't think that you could just do something like this, just go and report on stories that you thought 
were underreported, but they did. Um, and you know, they went to Cambodia, they went to Uzbekistan, they went to Israel and Palestine, like just all over the place. They made it happen. So I was really impressed by them, and I wanted to do something that could engage with the world like this, not in the way that I had before, where it was just kind of surface level, but really like get in there. So now I need to thank my mother again, because she's kind of responsible for my first book, How to Understand Israel in 60 Days or Less. We were arguing about the Israeli-Palestinian Israel, Israel conflict, um, as you do with your mother. Um, <laughs> we had similar but conflicting opinions about it, and she said, well, you know, if you think you know so much, why don't you go on one of those Birthright Israel trips and see for yourself? Um, if you don't know what Birthright is, it's a free trip for young Jewish people where you go to Israel for 10 days, all expenses paid, and you have a really good time, and you know, you get a connection with Israel. This was something that I had avoided for a long time. I had known about it, but I didn't want to go because I figured there's no such thing as a free lunch. You're going on this free tour to this country. They're obviously trying to sell you something, and I didn't want to do that. But I could make a book out of it. I could make a comic that was kind of like an extension of my journal comics, then maybe that would be a good reason to go. So I did. Um, here's me, looking kind of dreamy and out of it, <laughs> observing things. Um, I didn't really know what I was doing with this first book. I didn't even know it was going to be a book. I thought I would serialize it as mini comics. Um, so I just took a lot of notes. Uh, I did try to bring a recorder to kind of like record what people were saying, but I brought a mini disc recorder, which are now extinct. Um, and the first night I was there, I plugged it in to recharge the battery. Um, I had forgotten to bring a converter, and it started, smoke came out of it, and that was the end of the mini disc recorder. So I had to just write everything down as fast as I could. Um, I didn't realize it at the time, but I was using some elements of journalism by making these observations, taking these notes. Um, Here's what it looked like in its mini comic form. So it started out as a black and white comic like this. Um, and eventually it got picked up by Vertigo. I should thank here my first editor, John Vankin, who was just looking to experiment with new kinds of stuff. Vertigo is part of DC Comics. They do Batman, I think. I don't really know a lot about <laughs> DC. Um, and so he wanted to take a chance on me, you know, and this was really exciting to me, and so it's because of them that I had that first book, which is now published by Drawn and Quarterly as well. Um, but for five years, they published it and kept it in print, so thank you, John. The title of the book is a joke, because you can't understand any place in 60 days or less, much less a place like Israel. But I really did think that if I just read a lot about this place and the conflict, if I read a lot of articles, and then I went there and went on one of these trips that something would click and I would understand and I would be able to kind of like know what I'm talking about and be able to argue with my mom with no problem. Um, but that's not what happened. Um, it was a lot more complicated than I thought and this trip was a lot more complicated than I thought. Um, the way that they talked about the politics there was not what I expected. Um, but I was also kind of weighing are they manipulating me? Are they telling me the truth? What's going on? So this book really became an internal investigation. It's about being a young person and trying to understand how you see the world, how you see a particular conflict, who you can trust, and like really in the end you can only trust yourself. So comics are great for a kind of um, self-reflective book about your own imagination. So like here is a literal courtroom scene where I'm arguing with myself. You can really use a lot of fantasy with comics because it, it reflects the way we think. We think in words and pictures together. They kind of go in and out. We don't just think in one or the other. The so comics was great for that. Um, oops, double slide. Imagining history as we're standing in it. Imagining talking to ghosts and people in the past. And, you know, just showing how these emotions play out in this comic. So that was the first book. A memoir. I probably won't do another memoir again about my feelings, um, but it was helpful for me doing this project because it made me think a lot about how we receive information about the world and how we process that. And you know, I had always kind of just 
trusted the journalists to do the work for me or for books to do that work for me. So this is where things kind of dovetailed really nicely with what my friends at the Seattle Globalist were doing. Um, I was getting more and more interested in, in journalism and how it worked, and here they were as this window into that world for me. So I asked them lots of questions. Like They did most of their reporting in Seattle, where they had moved back from New York. But about once a year, they got to do a large-scale international reporting trip. Um, they went to East Africa to research water scarcity. They went to Pakistan to look into education. And when they would come back from these trips, I would ask them lots of questions. Like, how do you find a translator? How do you find a story? What the hell is a fixer? This word that you always hear but never really know what it is. Um, and so after a while, I wondered, like, maybe I could just go with them on one of these trips and I could do a comic about how they work. And I asked them and they said yes. And that is where Owen Blackouts came from. Um, I did a Kickstarter to fund my part of it. They had their own sources of funding. The original title was Stumbling Towards Damascus. I'm really glad I changed that. Um, but so I raised a bunch of money and then we were off. And that is the book. Their goal in going to Turkey, Syria, and Iraq was to look at the fallout from the Iraq War and the War on Terror because they're, they overlap but they're, they're separate things. This was in late 2010. And by this time, Obama had been elected. We were reeling from the financial crisis. And in the US, most people had really kind of wanted to turn the page on Iraq and didn't really want to hear more about the continuing struggle or the millions of refugees that had been made by that war. But these friends of mine thought that that was really worth investigating to look at how conflict like, permanently changes people's lives and how displacement and um, being a refugee comes out of these conflicts. So I went with them to that. So right away I saw that this was going to be a big challenge in a way that um, how to understand Israel in 60 days or less wasn't. Because this wasn't going to be about me or my interior imaginings of things. It was about other people. Um, and journalism, which to me sounded very like dramatic and fascinating and romantic, before I went on a reporting trip is actually a lot of sitting around in rooms talking or listening to people talk in my case. So I had to figure out how am I going to portray journalism in a way that doesn't make it seem boring because it is fascinating even if it's not like full of action. The other uh, struggle that I had to deal with was this was a really simple idea when I had it. I'm just going to do a book about journalists because to me journalists are fascinating. But once I got there, we're talking to refugees, to people who like, have really difficult and often traumatic stories. And so how am I going to portray their stories at the same time without poaching the reporting of my friends and also without making it seem like their stories are less important than the journalists? So it was really hard to kind of weave these things together um, because you know, in the end, this is not a contest about who's more important to listen to but we just have to make this book about everything. So here we go. We talked to refugees from Iran. And we talked to this man, San Malkandi, who has a really fascinating story. He was an Iraqi Kurd. He deserted the Iraq-Iran war in the 80s, was a refugee in Iran, um, was a refugee in Pakistan, um, made a family in all of that time, and finally was um, granted asylum in the US in, around right before 2001 um, and made a new life for himself there only to be accused of aiding an al-Qaeda terrorist and being detained for almost five years, actually a little more than five years, um, and then deported back to Iraq and separated from his family. So the journalists I was with um, were making a full-length documentary about him, um, which is called Barzan, and it's on Amazon and Hulu, I think. His story is really fascinating and it shows how every story in journalism is about the particular subject, but also about many other things. So for Sam, it was really um, an interesting look into our immigration system, um, the deportation system, and kind of how post 9-11, the paranoia that seeped into our country kind of gave the government reasons to cut corners um, and to just shuttle people away. So his story was fascinating. 
the central focus of my journalist friends was to go to Syria to report on Iraqi refugees in Syria. It's really hard for us to imagine now because of the way Syria has fallen apart over the past five or six years, but in late 2010, Syria was still a safe refuge for Iraqis. It was a country that had not fallen apart. It was doing pretty okay. Um, and Syria opened its borders to Iraqis fleeing the conflict. So we were there to interview them and to look into what it was like to be kind of caught in this limbo of being a refugee, not being able to go home because it's too dangerous, not being able to go to another country because the resettlement process is really complicated, and also not being able to resume your life because people can't work, they can't get higher education. So it was a really interesting and, and pretty heart-wrenching experience listening to these to my friends talk to these people. The last element of the book is this guy, Dan O'Brien. He was a childhood <coughs> friend of Sarah Studeville, and he had grown up like her in Seattle in a very um, kind of hippie um, family. Parents were very anti-war. And so he surprised everyone by joining the Marines in 2004, which is something that Sarah never really understood. So she invited him to come along on this trip, or he asked her if he could come on this trip. They can't agree on which one it is. Um, and she really wanted him to listen to these refugees and um, internally displaced Iraqis tell their stories about the war. And her plan was to interview him about his experience returning to Iraq and to make a radio documentary about what he thought about things now that he was back and seeing them from a civilian lens. Uh, things did not work out that well. They had a lot of arguments and conflict. And I thought that their relationship really says a lot about how we as a country are still talking about this war now. So this is a work of comics journalism, even though it's also about journalism. And I wanted it to have a certain kind of realism to it. Um, comics journalism is fairly new. I mean, besides Joe Sacco, there weren't a lot of people doing it. So those of us who are doing comics journalism, we know we need to work extra hard to have this taken seriously, seen as a legitimate form of journalism and not just you know, completely biased and we're not making things up. So unlike when I went to Israel, I brought a digital recorder with batteries. Um, <laughs> and I wanted to record everything. I wanted all of the dialogue in the book to be real dialogue. Um, and 99% it is. There's notes in the back that talk about the times when I couldn't have a recorder on. So when I came home, I had to basically transcribe hundreds of hours of tape. Um, it was not very fun. Um, and then that gets converted, edited down into a script. And by doing this, there was a couple of reasons that I wanted to, to like listen to all this audio instead of just like have somebody else do it. Um, one reason is I wanted to really get the tone of how people talk. And the other is that when you're making a comic like this, part of the point of it being a comic instead of something else is that you want to show body language and you want to show gesture. So there's things that are connected in our brain about um, audio and visual. And so when listening to these transcripts, I could kind of like remember being in these places, could almost like see the conversation going on, could remember body language and how people talked and how they were telling these stories. Um, so there's that, and also I wanted the dialogue to seem realistic, and I wanted you to feel like you were there on this reporting trip as well. So there were some interesting things that came up regarding language um, with working on this book. So it's really easy when you have a subject like Sam, who speaks almost perfect English um, and didn't need a translator or anything. You know, I could just portray him speaking his language as it was. But what do you do when you're talking to someone who speaks a different language? Um, this is a page from Joe Sacco, or actually a panel from a page. And what Joe does is he has the people speaking as if they're speaking English, but this has been translated by a translator. Um, and I think that really works for his work, because his work is just about hearing their story. But because my book was about showing the process of journalism, showing the process of interviewing people, 
I wanted to show when people were speaking different languages. And if they're speaking with an English word balloon, that means they're speaking English. If not, we had to do other things. So I did a lot of sending fragments of audio to translators and having them send them back to me in the original language. Um, sometimes we don't have a direct translation for you to read and you have to just trust that the interpreter is translating correctly. And that's how it feels for us to be there as well. Um, I did have to figure out how I was going to do kind of simultaneous translation. And for this, I borrowed from documentary film. I actually think that, you know, comics like mine sometimes have a lot in common with documentary film in the way that they're just kind of experiential, like that, and visual. And I thought about how am I going to make someone speaking another language and then a translator interpreting for them? Um, you could have the word balloon be full of scribbles, but that's a bad idea because <laughs> this is a real language. Um, someone recommended having a really teeny tiny word balloon that's empty, but that seemed like another weird solution. I think that was Tom, my editor, who's listening. Sorry, Tom, not a good idea. <laughs> and I thought about documentary again, and I thought about how they do it. And what they do is they'll have someone speaking, they do this on the radio too, someone starts speaking in their original language, and then the interpreter comes in on top and it's overdubbed. So that's the solution that I came up with. For scenes like this, you have them kind of speaking their language at first, but then you have balloons overlapping each other to show who's speaking originally and who's translating for them. Sometimes, like I said, there are scenes where you don't get to see um, what is being translated. In this scene, it's towards the end. This young woman was kind of interpreting for us. She's not a professional interpreter. We were at a UNHCR um, refugee center with her. She was collecting rations for her family, and she volunteered because people really wanted to talk to a bunch of Americans. Um, and they had some things to say to us, which she didn't always feel comfortable about translating because she didn't want us to feel bad, which is silly. But So these panels I left untranslated. If you can read Arabic, you can read what it says. I know what it says because my translator told me, but for everyone else, I want it to be a frustrating mystery. Um, but then you compare that to like, you know, this woman also speaks some English, a very small amount of English, but I wanted it to seem really real that when she did speak English to us, it was because she really wanted to communicate with us without someone in between. She wanted to get her real feelings to us as directly as possible. Um, so these panels where I'm showing her just speak in her imperfect English, but it's powerful to me because she gets to say what she wants to say without anybody saying, no, I'm not going to translate that. The recorder is one of my most valuable tools. I have three very valuable tools. Um, the second valuable tool is the camera. People ask me sometimes, why should this be a comic and not a prose novel or not a documentary? And I think that comics can really show a sense of place. So I'm very careful about gathering a lot of details when I'm somewhere. Um, because I want this to be a specific place. I don't want it to be just any street corner. I want it to be a street corner in Syria. So I gather a lot of reference materials. I'm just like always taking pictures of everything. Um, I really want someone who's from that place to be able to recognize this is the kind of um, tea boiler thing that would be in Damascus. But also using comics as a way to show things in the background without explicitly pointing them out. So in one area where this is definitely the case is in Syria, when you first arrive there, you just can't stop noticing all the portraits of Assad there are everywhere. Um, and you know, actually in the first chapter in Syria, these, our characters are all remarking on it and counting the portraits. But then as the chapter goes on, they stop looking at all of these portraits. They're just there in the background. So being able to include these in the background of the book kind of lets me mirror the experience for you of getting used to it, of not having someone pointed out, of having it just kind of be there. And maybe you notice it, or maybe you stop noticing it, because it becomes normal for you too. So yeah, photography helps me gather details about how places are different. You know, Iraqi Kurdistan has some very interesting architecture, some interesting traditional clothes. But I really want to be careful when working on comics about places that most Americans haven't visited that I don't otherize them. I turn them into these exotic, 
faraway lands, you know, with just minarets sticking up. These are cities, these are places where people live. And a lot of the stuff that you'll see is quite banal. It's something that you see at home. So this is Sam being interviewed in an empty room of his parents' house where he now lives. And something that interested me a lot was this blue plastic chair, the photo of that same room. And I saw this chair a lot. We sat in a lot of these chairs in all of the countries that we visited and you know, seen them in the US. I've seen them in Europe. And they're probably all made in the same factory in China. And that chair, to me, really represents, like, this is a globalized world we live in. This is a world where there's a lot of stuff that we all have in common. And it kind of, you know, it might sound a little cliche, but it kind of mirrors that, like, deep down, we're all the same. We have very specific places that we come from, experiences that, you know, are hard to understand, that are hard to just, like, identify with. But we all sit in plastic chairs. We all have breakfast and... We all love our families. And you know, for the story of Sam, who was separated from his family, that was really important to show. So I do try to spend a lot of time making sure that those similarities, those boring scenes of corners of rooms, are available. Um, photography is also good for making things look right. So I did take art anatomy in art school, but didn't remember a lot. So. <laughs> A series of panels like this is actually hard to do. Um, so I take a lot of pictures, or my husband takes a lot of pictures of me modeling a lot of different poses. <laughs> this is my cartoonist uniform, <laughs> my pajamas and slippers in the apartment we were subletting. So I have tons and tons of pictures like these, and those are how we kind of put together um, a scene like this. You just use whatever you have for props. Um, and then the third very important tool is the sketchbook. People sometimes ask me if I draw all of this stuff on the spot. And I really, really wish I could. I wish that I could like freeze time and just do drawings of everything that I see. But the reality is there's not always a lot of time. There's almost never enough time. And so when you're taking notes, um, you're kind of noting what part of the recording you're on, you're taking pictures, um, and you're just like observing people's body language and stuff, there isn't time to draw. But the sketchbook is really important for times when it's not appropriate to have a camera out or when you want to get extra details. So interviews with refugees, for example. You know, I didn't take pictures of these people. I had to rely on these sketches. Um, and I always get permission from people to include them in this work. Let them know what I'm doing there. They're usually like, cool, cartoonist, sounds nice, whatever. Uh, some of them are excited about it. but. Um, Sketchbook also very handy for border crossings, places where there are police um, and where you might not want to get caught with a camera out. So this is the border crossing from Turkey into Iraq, northern Iraq. Um, and I don't always know what I'm going to need later. So I just kind of sketch as quickly as possible. Um, and that building on the bottom became this building here, which is like where we sat and waited for our passports to get examined. Um, I do a lot of floor plans, so that on the upper right is a floor plan. Um, it's a great way to be able to reconstruct a room later. because You can't just like draw from every angle. If you have a floor plan, then you know where things are. So between the floor plan there and then the sketch of these chairs on the left with colors notated, I can put this together later. There's a scene that involves a cockfight in this book. Um, it's not exactly illegal in Iraqi Kurdistan, but they asked us not to take any pictures while the fight was going on because the men who were there, and they were all men, um, didn't really want people to know that they were there. Um, so I did a kind of sketch of the scene, and then when everyone left, I was able to take photos of this disgusting room um, and kind of get a feel for how it looked, and then that can be put together in the end to make this page. Um, Sometimes little details are just for me, by the way. Like, I loved these portraits of these chickens. They're just like so regal and noble. Um, and so I put them in the background there, even though you probably can't even tell what I'm trying to show you there. But a lot of comics is fun. It's fun to draw. And so we like to put in little Easter eggs for ourselves, sometimes things that just a few people can, can understand, um, or sometimes even just things that only a person who's from that place um, would recognize. But it's really fun to, to inject these things into the comics. Um, the sketchbook is also great for just working out how a character is going to look. 
So you don't always have a lot of photo reference of characters. And in this book, there are lots of characters. Almost every scene, there's new people who get involved in our project who are you know, being interviewed. This guy was our fixer. I found out what a fixer is. And I didn't have really many photos of him, so I had to spend a lot of time kind of figuring mm -hmm. out how to draw him. Um, so the sketchbook is great for that. And this is kind of a page in process. Everything is hand watercolored. I don't use computer coloring, not because I think there's anything wrong with computer coloring, but just because I don't know how to do it well. Um, I think just because I learned how to paint um, when I was younger, there's no way for me to switch gears now. So um, the painting is actually the fun part of the book, where I get to like just kind of loosen up. Um, the drawing part is the hardest. There's the finished guy. Mad. That's the part where I think another editor, Matt Bors, um, when I came back from this trip, I wanted to get to work right away on this book because nothing seemed more important to me than the situation of Iraqi refugees. But I knew it was going to take years for it to come out. And luckily this guy, who was, being, who was then the editor for a website called Cartoon Movement, wrote to me and asked me if I would make a comic about Iraqi refugees in Syria because he had heard that I was there. Um, and he was trying to get new material for this kind of new website. Um, and so I said yes, and I was so happy to have the opportunity to make this comic. Um, I asked for permission from my Seattle Globalist friends if I could use their reporting to make a comic about what we had just seen. Um, they said yes, and you know I was just so excited to be able to bring this information to people because I thought, this is a tragedy that nobody knows about, that no one cares about, that there are these people who are displaced because of us, and we're not doing enough to help them. We're giving them some money, and we're letting some of them in, but not enough. And so I really had this fantasy that I could make this comic about them, tell people how they could help, and that they were going to all write to their congressperson, and they were going to like donate money, and I don't know, we'd solve the problem somehow um, with my comic on the internet. And of course, that's not what happened. I think most beginning journalists make this mistake, thinking that they can you know, change the situation that they're trying to report on. And the truth is that you're, if anything, a tiny drop in the bucket. Um, but that doesn't mean it's not worth it to try. So I thank Matt for giving me that experience. And also, he's been my editor now since 2011, basically. Um, and he's given me the opportunity to try other kinds of comics reportage. So a book like this takes, this book took five and a half years to make. Um, it's a lot of work, um, but a lot of stuff that I do is a lot quicker. So this was, I went to the Occupy camp in Miami in 2011, and I was able to turn this around in one day. So there's ways of just drawing stuff on site and having it be mostly text and turning it around. Um, this is a comic I did, a profile of Jill Stein, the Green Party candidate, which was relatively quick for me. It only took a couple months, about a month of reporting and then a month of drawing. Um, and so comics like these have different lifespans. So a comic like this will maybe get a little attention, some people reading it online, but then it'll kind of disappear into the ether and no one will ever look at it again. Um, and that's great in its own way, but something that I love about having the opportunity to make a book like Rolling Blackouts is that it exists for longer and that it gives me also an opportunity to like go around talking about refugees. Um, no one's going to interview you about a comic that's on the internet, but if you do a book, then like maybe some people are going to want to talk to you, and you can actually talk more about the whatever issue it is that you really care about. Um, and this came out right before Trump was elected, so it became very important for me to talk about refugees when that was going on. Um, sometimes I use comics just as a way to like try and trick people into reading things. Um, so. You know, I think that things like a political candidate, maybe no one's going to read about that if I just had an article. Um, but if it's a comic, then people will. And the same thing happens. I started making these kind of really quick comics. Like this one's about what a sanctuary city is. Um, they're kind of, I kind of envision them as illustrated tweets because that's all they are. They're just me giving my opinion and telling you why you should care about sanctuary cities. But there's something about drawing them and putting them up as drawings that can maybe trick people into reading a thing that otherwise might just like fall into the grand flow of information that we see every day. Um, maybe not. And so 
that is what I have. And so thank you for being here and for maybe reading the book if you want to. And thanks for listening to me. I have a question about the pages that you make. Mm -hmm. Are they, are, is each panel painted as a page or are they painted one page together? So in other words, are they big and then shrunk down? Yeah, they're big yeah. and then shrunk down. Yeah. So the pages that you see there, that is what's on the page when I make it. Although I work in a grid, so it gives me some freedom to edit things a little bit later. I'm a big editor. I like to edit the text. And I like to kind of go back to a page and say, no, I don't like that, and taking it out. So a lot of times I'll like take out one square, one panel, and then make a new panel and stick it in. But it's still about like nine boxes per page. So it's not just, you're not doing nine individual paintings yeah. and putting, OK, got yeah. it. And do you, um, do you ink all your text? Is it by hand? No. Um, actually, it's, it's funny you mentioned that, because when my first book got picked up by Vertigo, um, they had two conditions for me. One was that I had to do it in color, because I think that just sells better, maybe. Um, but I was like, sure, sounds great. And the other was that they have someone else letter it, because my lettering was atrocious. Yeah. Um, so we had a letter who made a font out of my handwriting. Yeah. And then for the new book, um, we made a different font um, out of my handwriting. But it is, it is a font. The word balloons are all hand-drawn, but they're put together on different layers digitally. Got it. OK, thank yeah. you. Thank you. Awesome. Hello. Hi. Uh, comics uh, striking as a very subjective medium in that every line, whether mm -hmm. it's a text line or an image line, all is filtered through your process. How does that relate to journalism? How does that, that sort of affect the journalistic mode? That's a very good question. It's something that I think about a lot. And it's why we work extra hard to do things like you know have real text there that's taken from audio. Um, some cartoonists who do this kind of work put their citations in. Because uh, we know that we have to build trust with you. It's our job to make sure that you trust us, not your job to look at it and say, yeah, sure. If she says it's true, then it's true. Um, so I think it is something that all journalists have to think about. Because when you look at something that's um, written in prose, um, or a documentary, or even photos, if you're taking a photo, you can cut stuff out. I mean, now we have to be afraid of people using Photoshop. And so there's always a chance that a journalist could be lying to you. And usually the way that we get around that is either they're working for a publication that you know has integrity and that they're going to really be on top of people for that. Um, and in cases of people like me who don't have that, like I don't have the New York Times behind me, like it's my job to kind of make you trust me in other ways. Um, so using the real dialogue is part of that. Um, and I just do the best job I can. And I try to be really transparent. Um, there are notes in the back of the book that talk about anything that you know happened to be in a different place than you know, it's portrayed, which is very infrequently. Um, and I just try to get you to trust me. So, But that is one of the things that I actually like about comics journalism, though, um, is that you can never forget that somebody made this. And I think that is a problem that we have with other kinds of journalism is that we're so used to it. And there is kind of like a machine separating us from that. Like, what is text? You know, there's a lot of distance between us and text. So it's easy to forget when you're reading something or when you're looking at video that you, you have to trust this person as well. It's easy to just kind of take it at face value. And I mean, we've seen this past year what happens when, you know, people think that everything that they read or see is true. So what I like about comics is that on every single page, you're reminded that somebody made this, and somebody was there, and do I trust them or not? And you know, I think that decision is up to you in the end. But you know, I think it's good to be reminded that you're constantly making that decision with every page you read. Hi, thanks for your talk and your book, which just looks great. I had somewhat technical questions, two specifically, but they relate. Did you write the text first and then work from the script? And then also, how did you maintain a consistent visual style? And that relates to just how long did it take you? Were you able to produce it all in a short amount of time? Oh, I love talking about this kind of stuff. Um, <laughs> I do work from a script, um, but there's kind of gaps in when I was working on it. So 
The Syrian chapter, which is at the end, was the hardest for me to work on. And so I had done the script for the first two thirds of the book, and I was really stuck on that. Um, and it was my husband. Oh, I forgot to thank my husband. Oh, whoops. Um, well, he was great. Uh, still is. <laughs> And it was, he kind of said, like, why don't you just like start drawing the rest and just leave that for now? Like, you can come back to it later. And he was right. Sometimes things just need a while longer to stew um, and for you to kind of have time when you're just taking walks and just thinking about them and not force them out. So there was a big gap in the time that I made the script for the first half, uh, first two thirds and the last. Um, but yeah, I like to have a script. Because my work is nonfiction, it really like, is a comfort for me to have something to work off of. And when I'm writing the script, I'm really thinking visually as well. Um, sometimes there will even be little cues in the script, like I'm describing what the panel is going to look like, kind of like a screenplay. Um, it's very similar. And so I do that all in advance. And as for the visual style changing over time, it does. Um, if you open that book, the first page was actually done towards the end. And I decided to put it into the first part of the book. And then if you look at the second page, it looks a lot different. Sometimes it looks a lot different to me, and maybe someone else won't notice it. It's actually funny. My husband and I, he's a cartoonist as well. And we did a dual wedding invitation. So he drew me, and I drew him. And we sent it out to our family. And most of them couldn't tell that two different people drew it, even though to us it looked so different. So a lot of times, artists, uh, cartoonists really like uh, agonize over the fact that if you're working on something for years, it's going to change and it's going to like look different. But most people won't really notice. It's just us that wish we could go back and redo the first hundred pages. <laughs> I think we are just about out of time, about five o'clock. So remember, everyone, we are having a book sale and we're having a signing with Sarah following the event, this event. And please join me in thanking Sarah Glidden for such a thought-provoking talk. Thank you.